What killed the dinosaurs? The Ice Age! Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 worst movie casting choices. What are you doing here in Kazakhstan? Avoiding those kind of questions. For this list, we've picked casting choices that, after the movies were released, still left people scratching their heads. While other casting decisions were controversial, some of them worked out for the better. Which of these casting choices still irks you to this day? Let us know in the comments below. Number 20. Steve Martin as Inspector Clouseau, The Pink Panther Here's a recipe for a definite misfire. Recast a comedian's signature character. By perfecting the clumsy idiot who takes himself too seriously act, Peter Sellers became Clouseau. That is what I have been saying, you idiot. This performance didn't define or typecast the actor, but it became difficult to separate Peter Sellers from Clouseau once the man's mastery was brought to the screen. Comparatively, Steve Martin presents a goof from start to finish. Officer Jacques Clouseau, gendarme, third class. Of course, he wasn't the first to take the role after Sellers, but his performance felt like the most painful. I have in my pocket a couple of adverts for us. What? This is supposed to be a legit inspector after all, and this measure of just enough seriousness was present within the performances of Roger Moore, Alan Arkin, and Sellers, but could have been better amplified when Martin took over the role in 2006. That had to help. Number 19. Terrence Howard as Lieutenant Colonel James Rhodey Rhodes, Iron Man. Who's this? It's Rhodes. Sorry, hello? I said it's Rhodes. Speak up, please. What the hell is that noise? Most of us didn't take much issue with Terrence Howard's casting as Rhodey, but there was certainly a noticeable difference in quality when the role was recast for the sequel. I didn't expect to see you here. Look, it's me. I'm here. Deal with it. Let's move on. In hindsight, Howard's rose came off as whiny and reactive, easily letting Stark's antics get under his skin, and he didn't really come off as a decorated military colonel. Okay, you too. By contrast, Don Cheadle plays the role with confidence, seeming like a caring friend, but not a pushover. You gotta get upstairs and get on top of the situation right now. Listen, I've been on the phone with the National Guard all day, trying to talk them out of rolling tanks up the PCH, knocking down your front door, and taking these. With War Machine as your alter ego, chances are you're all about business. But that is exactly what we didn't get from Howard in the first Iron Man. Put your hand down. You think you got what it takes to wear that suit? We don't have to do this, Tony. You want to be the War Machine? Take your shot. Put it down. Number 18, Jesse Eisenberg as Lex Luthor, Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice. It seems as if the casting of Lex Luthor within Superman's cinematic outings always falls a bit short of the mark. True friend of the Library of Metropolis, Mr. Lex Luthor. Me? Ah. First, there was Gene Hackman's Lex rocking a full head of hair throughout most of Superman the movie. Then there's the less than stellar reception to Superman Returns in 2006. This trend continued when Jesse Eisenberg was cast as the evil genius in 2016 for Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice. Hey, you don't think Dad would mind, do you? If I changed just one thing in this room. Eisenberg's quirky mannerisms felt grating to some, and his overall menace never quite felt earned throughout that film. Hmm. Out of tricks, out of time, and one bat head short. If anything, this Luther felt more like a sidekick than Superman's arch nemesis, and that is never a good thing. You're psychotic. That is a three syllable word for any thought too big for little minds. Mm, next category, circles. Number 17, Kevin Costner as Robin Hood. Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Wrong. This is my land and my tree. Therefore, whatever's in it also belongs to me. Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves surprised audiences when it was released with its solemn tone and level of violence. Though the actors aren't to blame for this tonal misfire, casting Kevin Costner as Robin Hood is one decision that still boggles moviegoers to this day. This is due to his missing British accent and his lack of attempt to replicate one. You'll have to fight me for it. <laughs> Love to, mate. Also gone were the smart quips and fantastic sense of fun Robin Hood was known for. Get up! Move faster! Move faster. 
Great idea. In their place was a hero that took himself too seriously and took away all the playfulness that often accompanies stories of Robin Hood and his merry band of thieves. Forget yourself, Azim. I do not ask for your company or counsel. Number 16, George Clooney as Batman, Batman and Robin. We know, we've ripped on this movie a lot, but how can you not? Despite his indisputable acting skills, one can't help but notice that Clooney is totally absent while wearing the cape and cowl. Why are all the gorgeous ones homicidal maniacs? Sure, the performance leans into Bruce Wayne as a playboy, but the action sequences are left lacking by Clooney's lack of commitment. Pull back, you can't make the jump. I can make it! Pull back! There's a reason why Batman and Robin is so maligned by fans of the dark and seriously toned Batman stories. This one feels more indebted to the Batman TV show from 66. Hey, freeze. The heat is on. That's not an insult, by the way. It just needed a different actor to bring that sort of energy to the screen. And George Clooney was not that actor. She knows who we are. Guess we'll just have to kill her. Yep, we'll kill her later. We have work to do. He probably knew it was a bomb before anyone else, and planned to escape with what dignity he could by looking like the kid who's too cruel for his role in the dumb high school play. A bat bomb! We have to blow up this rocket before it turns Gotham into a crater. Number 15, Tyler Perry as Alex Cross. Alex Cross. Cross here. Based on the successful book series, the character Alex Cross is no stranger to the big screen. This is Alex Cross, DCPD. I need to talk to you. Okay. Morgan Freeman played the role with gravitas in previous films like 1997's Kiss the Girls, but the same can't be said for Tyler Perry when he took a stab at the psychologist and police lieutenant in 2012. Are you having fun? Though his performance isn't the worst we've ever seen, his too serious attitude is so laughably bad that it hurts. You are one sick, twisted son of a bitch, do you know that? Dr. Cross, you're taking this personally. Yeah, about as personal as you took running out of that building with your tail tucked between your legs. Of course, having his Medea role follow him certainly didn't help sell him as an action star either. Have a oh, good hell, day. No, you gonna Next. pack five? You gonna give me five years? And you ain't gonna take me back there to get. Come on, here. What you gonna do? What the hell are you gonna do? Hey, you know, you ain't gonna take me out of here. I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna. Number 14, Topher Grace as Eddie Brock slash Venom, Spider Man 3. When casting gears so far from the character in the comics, you better be doing so to accommodate a great actor. Daddy! Hey, I'm the new guy. Topher Grace does what he can with the material, but he's just not believable as an Eddie Brock who's already pretty physically intimidating, at least compared to Parker, before melding with an alien symbiote. I want to kill the spider. You want to kill the spider. Together, he doesn't stand a chance. Interested? Additionally, once Venom appears on the screen, the chances for Grace to emote or bring anything else special to the role essentially disappear. Hey, Parker. My god, Eddie. Ooh, my spider sense is tingling. There was probably no way this was gonna go right back in 2007. Although, it is a good thing Tom Hardy stepped into Brock's shoes in the modern day in order to give that character a new lease on life. You made me lose my girl. Now I'm gonna make you lose yours. How's that sound, Tiger? Number 13, Colin Farrell as Alexander. Alexander. The greatest honor a man can ever achieve is to live with great courage. Undefeated in battle, Alexander the Great is one of history's most accomplished military commanders, building one of the largest ancient world empires during his reign. Conquer your fear! And I promise you, you'll conquer death! Colin Farrell, although an accomplished actor, lacked the presence and charisma needed to portray the historical figure. No! No! You've taken from me! Everything I've ever loved made me you! you Stop it! Stop acting like a boy! With the 2004 epic historical drama already lagging from a less than interesting story and painful narration, Harold tries his best but fails to evoke even the slightest response from audiences struggling to sit through this nearly three-hour film. This is one history lesson we'd all like to forget. And Clyde has spoke true. 
Number 12, Vince Vaughn as Norman Bates, Psycho. Well, you should. You should mind. I do. I just, I say that I don't. <laughs> the idea of remaking Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho shot for shot felt extraneous. And you know what? It was. Do a vacancy? Well, we have 12 in fact. 12 cabins, 12 vacancies. <laughs> Today, Vince Vaughn has proven he can do drama as well as comedy, but this wasn't totally proven back in 1998. So it sort of makes sense why director Gus Van Zandt would give Vaughn a shot. What was it you want to ask me? Looking for a missing person. My name's Arbogast. I'm a private investigator. Mm -hmm. The problem is, well, it's a shot-for-shot -shot remake. Vaughn is impersonating Anthony Perkins because that's what he's been hired to do. As a result, Psycho doesn't give the actor any chance to branch out or do his own thing. So, the performance suffers, the movie suffers, and the audience suffers. End of story. Shut up! Away. Shut up! Huh? Number 11, Jared Leto as the Joker, Suicide Squad. Don't hurt me. I'll be your friend. Man, what's with DC having a hard time casting some of the greatest all-time villains? Sure, the shoes of both Jack Nicholson and Heath Ledger are gigantic, and attempting to fill them was a job that probably wouldn't be envied by any actor. I don't want no beef. You don't want no beef? You don't want Why, no beef? Wrong? You don't want no beef? Yeah. However, we don't doubt that Jared Leto was up to the task, at least on an emotional level. Unfortunately, they saddled Leto with such a poor visual design, complete with tattoos that just look woefully out of place. You left me in a black hole of rage and confusion. Seriously, are we to believe that the clown prince of crime was going to sit still at his local neighborhood tattoo shop to get those done? Do it! <laughs> Number 10, Hayden Christensen as Anakin Skywalker, Star Wars Episode II, Attack of the Clones, and Star Wars Episode III, Revenge of the Sith. It's hot take time here at the WatchMojo Courthouse. You love me. Does Hayden Christensen deserve justice for his performance as Anakin Skywalker, or does the fault lie within the young actor's petulance and overall whininess? He never listens. He, he doesn't understand. It's not fair. Actors are hired to recite the script they're given, and the Star Wars prequels had some pretty bad scripts courtesy of George Lucas. Is Christensen's line delivery the greatest? They're like animals, and I slaughtered them like animals. I hate them! No, no it's not. And the actor does a lot of mumbling and fumbling that make it easy to dislike these performances. However, one could argue that the quieter moments, scenes that require restraint and facial acting from Christensen, lend themselves a little bit better. The jury may be split, but there's no denying that these films were disliked by a lot of fans. No! Number 9. Marlon Brando as Sakini, the tea house of the August Moon. Robbery ladies, kind of gentlemen, please to introduce myself. Despite being a satire, the casting of Marlon Brando as Okinawan villager Sakini in the tea house of the August Moon was a strange choice. Sakini by name, interpreter by profession. Brando spent months preparing for the role and had makeup applied to make him look Asian. Sakini here, boss. Don't ever put your finger on an officer. Although the actor was the major selling point, Brando's face makeup distracts from the movie and makes you wonder why they wouldn't just cast an actor who already looked the part ethnically, which would have left Brando to play the role opposite Sakini instead. Pull your socks up. Very sorry, boss. Very sorry. Socks so up. Anything more, boss? That'll be all. Although the comedy was a success, it definitely paved the way for more odd casting decisions to come. Good night, boss. Number 8. Rosie O'Donnell as Betty Rubble, The Flintstones There's no denying that Rosie O'Donnell nailed the Betty Rubble laugh during her performance in the 1994 Flintstones film. I've never seen him so excited about something that you couldn't spread mayonnaise on. <laughs> <laughs> the similarities tend to end there, however, and we're never quite able to separate the fact that we're just watching Rosie O'Donnell doing said laugh for about 90 minutes. <laughs> oh, Barney, isn't he precious? Precious? He'd have been better off with a monkey. Oh, we can totally see why O'Donnell was cast around this time, since this was when her star power and influence were definitely on the rise. There seems to be a slight problem with your credit card. 
Really? And what would that be? Yet we just can't help but wonder what would have happened if a different actor had been allowed to portray a version of Betty that felt more in line with the classic cartoon. It's gonna get better. One day, we're gonna look back on all this, and we'll laugh. Geez, I hope so, Betty, because tomorrow they got me testing shark repellent. Number seven, Keanu Reeves as Jonathan Harker, Bram Stoker's Dracula. I have offended you with my ignorance, Count. Keanu Reeves has had a very successful career, but is definitely no stranger to being miscast, such as in 2008's The Day the Earth Stood Still. I'll try. I must get back to the city. In Dracula, he plays Jonathan Harker, a solicitor helping with the title count's estate acquisition. As if I have a part to play in a story that is not known to me. Acting alongside juggernauts like Gary Oldman and Anthony Hopkins, it's clear from the get-go that Reeves is out of his element and depth. I know where the bastard sleeps. I brought him there. His performance is hard to watch, with his accent standing out as one of the worst ever put to film. We'll not let you go into the unknown alone. Number six, Denise Richards as Christmas Jones. The world is not enough. They're stealing us in. Who are you? I work for the British government. Sometimes you just gotta go for that low hanging fruit, right? The elephant in the room was that no one, and we mean no one, was buying Denise Richards as Christmas Jones, nuclear physicist. Are you here for a reason? Or are you just hoping for a glimmer? And you are? Then again, the focus of female characters within the James Bond franchise has always centered more on the physical than the practical. And Richards was a hot property back in 1999. The hydrogen gas level's too high! One spark of the reactor will blow! I have to stop it! Still, the actress doesn't step into Jones's shoes with any sort of real energy, and her legacy within the Bond franchise is far beneath other superior characters that proved their brains and skill. But the world's greatest terrorist running around with six kilos of weapons-grade plutonium can't be good. I have to get it back, or somebody's gonna have my ass. Number five, Arnold Schwarzenegger as Dr. Victor Freeze, Mr. Freeze, Batman and Robin. If someone told you that you can never have too many puns, then they surely have not seen this disaster piece. Allow me to break the ice. My name is Freeze. Learn it well. Without question, 1997's Batman and Robin is the lowest point in Batman's big screen career, as director Joel Schumacher lays on the cheese by casting Arnold Schwarzenegger as the cold and pun-filled Mr. Freeze. What killed the dinosaurs? The Ice Age! Arnold physically looks the part, but unfortunately, all believability is lost the second he opens his mouth. I'm afraid that my condition has left me cold to your pleas of mercy. The actor made a name for himself with charisma and token one-liners, but what's on display here is too unbearable to watch. I will pull Batman's heart from his body and feel it freeze in my hands. <sighs> Number four, Sofia Coppola as Mary Corleone, The Godfather Part Three. I believe you. I'm glad you're around. I'm glad you're here too. In 1985, John Huston directed his daughter Angelica to an Oscar-winning performance in Prizzi's honor. I got a reputation to live up to. In 1990, Francis Ford Coppola directed his daughter Sophia to crush what might have been history's greatest film saga with the lumbering weight of her wooden performance. Why are you, you don't have to do this to me, please. Imagine what might have been had Madonna, Julia Roberts, or Winona Ryder played the role. Tony says that I'm a front for the foundation that you're using me just to pull the strings. Sure, it's difficult to place all of the blame on Sophia, since she was so inexperienced at the time. But today, it seems as if the younger Coppola is still atoning for her cinematic sins in The Godfather Part Three. Dad? Number three, Mickey Rooney as I.Y. Uniyoshi, Breakfast at Tiffany's. Michiko Raifri! I wrote this! Despite prompting some laughs when Breakfast at Tiffany's was originally released, casting Mickey Rooney in the role of Mr. Yuniyoshi caused quite the stir in later years. You cannot go on or keep ringing my bell! You disturb me! You must have a key made! Many feel that there's nothing funny about this offensive caricature of the Japanese people. In 30 seconds, I got to call the police! 
Daddy! Of course, casting a Japanese actor instead probably wouldn't have made the situation any better either, considering the role. Today's world is a lot more sensitive to portrayals such as this, and this casting proved that we should be more mindful when populating such roles. If you don't stop with that pornograph, right this minute I'm going to go to the police department! Well, that's more better! Number 2. John Wayne as Genghis Khan, The Conqueror. We attack as planned. Is it an overstatement to say that casting all-American John Wayne as 12th century Mongolian Emperor Genghis Khan was the craziest thing producer Howard Hughes ever did? Maybe because Hughes was known for his eccentricity, but this casting is just on another level. Where is your faith, my brother? I was to bring under my standard all the tribes of the Gobi. None would dare stand against me. We realize it was a different time, and that it was commonplace for Caucasian actors to take on roles that should have gone to someone else, but let's face it, trading John Wayne's cowboy hat for that mustache wasn't enough to make him credible. Return to your people, Target Tai, and speak well of the Mongols' generosity. It doesn't matter that Wayne himself petitioned heavily for the part. This idea should have never left the drawing board. Let's hear no more of this. I have made great conquests. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. The Whole Cast – The Last Airbender It wasn't very smart. M. Night Shyamalan's take on the much-beloved animated series will go down in history as one of the most awful film adaptations ever made. They had his chance. They missed it. Aside from its completely unforgivable visual effects, and the fact that it stripped the fun out of the story, he decided to change up all the ethnicities of the show's characters on a whim. You didn't tell me that. You didn't ask. This was compounded by acting that can only be described as mind-numbingly bad across the board. The Avatar actors awkwardly fumble through each scene, and are either numb or too emotional, as if acting were a completely second language to them. What? It's just too much of a shame to bear. Why, Shyamalan? Why? You make me fire out of nothing! Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.